Yes, okay. we are on. All right, well, let's open the prayer room. Father, thank you for the fact that we can glorify you. Thank you for being our glorious triune God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. I pray that you would bless this class period, strengthen me as a teach, help me be clear. I pray to help the students to understand, and that uh, you would uh, strengthen our understanding of who you are and our love and uh, devotion to you as our glorious triune God. I pray this for Christ's sake. Amen. Okay, we're talking about the history of Trinitarianism here. And hopefully we'll see if we can wrap it up today. Uh, can you um, tell me one of the one of the bad people that was uh, that was around at the time who helped to move us from Trinitarian move certain people from Trinitarianism to Arianism. said the Holy Spirit is an impersonal force. Some of them said that he uh, was the highest being created by the Son. So the Father created the Son, and the Son created the Holy Spirit. There's an infinite gap between them. Remember the name, who was the name of a uh, patristic writer who actually had major problems, who was also influential in leading to the development of Arianism? By, by pagan philosophy that made the sun to the demiurge, which was this being that was created. The sun, you would call the sun God, but only the Father can be called the God. So he can be God. And then the Holy Spirit, who is the Holy Spirit according to origin? I mean, um, Origen contributed to the rise of Arianism, but Origen actually wasn't totally an Arian. He was not committed all the way, but he contributed to the rise of Arianism. So, okay, we've covered the history here up through the Council of Nicaea. So now we're talking about the Nicene Trinitarianism, the Trinitarianism from the uh, time of the Council of Nicaea. <coughs> what year was the Council of Nicaea? 
um, conducted? Eighty three twenty five. Good. Eighty three twenty five. Yeah. So um, by this time, the um, modalists who were led by a man named Sibelius, so there were still modalists around, but the Council of Nicaea was convened against the Arians. The Arians had basically finally arisen, weren't Arians for a while, and now they are trying to uh, um, you know, say their thing here. Now, um, the theories that were around at the time <coughs> Uh, about uh, the nature of God. You had the Sibelians around, and the Sibelians were the modalists, so they were around, saying the Father is the Son, and the Son is the Father. And then you had the theory, you had people who were kind of overreacting against that and making the three persons into three entirely separate beings. <coughs> That would be tritheism, so that's wrong. Um, and then you had people who were um, saying the Father alone is the one God, and the Son and the Spirit are creatures. That would be the Arians. And then you had the uh, people who believed in the true God, the Trinitarians, who um, uh, did not divide uh, the oneness of God. Um, nor make the Son and the Spirit into creatures. And so they recognize um, the persons of the Godhead properly. Um, now, as we're going to look here at the Nicene Trinitarianism, let's review the Nicene Creed here for a second. So if you have the Nicene Creed there, um, let's see what, take a look at what it says. Um, it should be on page five and six of your um, those beginning introductory notes. <coughs> you guys have it? Okay. It says there we believe in one God, the Father, Almighty Maker, have an earth of all things visible and invisible. So right there, Trinitarians are not tritheists, so they believe in one God. And in one Lord Jesus Christ, uh, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of the Father before all ages, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, one in essence with the Father. By him all things were made. And that word one in essence is the key word homoousios, one um, in essence. And this is going to be a disputed word here. Um, for us men and for our salvation, he came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Ghost, the Virgin Mary, and was made a man. Oh, by the way, back to the first clause, the Father being made from heaven and earth, all things visible and invisible. We're not getting into this too much, but the Gnostics would have denied it. You know, they had the idea that, that the God of the Old Testament was this evil God who created the world. And so they denied that in the Nicene Creed also. Anyway, for us men and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate by the Holy Ghost, the Virgin Mary, and was made a man. He was crucified for us under Pontius Pilate and suffered and was buried in the third day he rose again according to the scriptures and ascended in heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father from thence he will come again with glory to judge the living and the dead his kingdom will have no end. And we believe in the Holy Spirit. Now, the next part but it was not in the original Nicene Creed. They just said we believe in the Holy Spirit. Um, and then, uh, did they add anything after that? But that was the, the main thing about, about, about God. And it was, the reason they didn't get into more detail in 325 about the Holy Spirit is because that his person wasn't under attack at the time. It was the person of the Son, so they dealt with what was actually getting attacked. Now, um, Origen reject, rejected the idea that the Son and the Father are homoousios, one in essence. Um, instead, they said the Son, he said the Son was of another essence, of a different essence than the Father. So, um, <clears throat> that was his idea, and uh, part of his reason for that was he wanted to be not a Sibelian, not a modalist, and certainly if you say that the father and son are different essences, uh, or of another essence, then you're not going to be a modalist, but you also, jettison is some pretty important doctrine here. Um, so, 
Origen said that the Son was of another nature than the Father, inferior to the Father. The Father was God of himself, even though uh, he wasn't willing to say the Son was a creature. Now, Arius took Origen's ideas here, and recognizing that there can't be a type of essence that's halfway between God and the creature, concluded that the Son is not true God, really, in any sense at all, but is strictly a creature, of the highest of all creatures. So, the um, Orthodox were saying that the Son is of the essence of the Father. This is what the Orthodox were saying. This is true Orthodoxy. Um, while the Arians were saying that the Son is a creature um, who was of um, creature out of um, ex uk anton of nothing. So he wasn't he was, the Son is not of the essence of the Father. He's not begotten so that he partakes of the Father's essence, but he's a creature who is made of nothing. And that there once was when he was not. So these are kind of key Arian phrases. That the Son is a creature who is of nothing, instead of being of the essence of the Father. And there once was, there was a time when the Son did not exist. So those are the opposite ideas they're arguing for. Um, now Arius lived in Alexandria in um, no, Egypt. <coughs> and Arius was opposed by a man named Alexander, who was his bishop. These guys seemed to be in the developing um, Catholic Church with some hierarchy. They weren't, they weren't among the, uh, the Baptists of the time. And so um, Aria, um, Alexander said that the son is of the identical substance with the father. And so, um, he said the Son, as the Logos, as the wisdom of God, must be eternal. For otherwise, if the Son, if the wisdom of God, as the Son, was not eternal, then there would have been time when the Father had no wisdom. So, um, that was one thing he was saying. Now, finally, in uh, 325 AD, they convened this council at Nicaea. There were over 300 bishops there. Now, these guys weren't all, like I said, these, this is, these aren't Baptist people at this point. This is, um, I don't know if you call it Roman Catholicism, you know, but it's developing uh, Roman Catholicism. But they did get this correct, this, this particular decision correct. They've united with, a, with a, the state at this point too. So we don't think that they're all, everybody there was the most wonderful person, even though they got the doctrine right. Um, now, what they, um, were trying to assert is they were trying to, um, okay, the modalists had seized on the class of texts which teach the unity of God, and they neglected those which teach his real uh, trinality. Um, while Arians had asserted the distinct personality of the Son at the expense of his unity of essence. And so what they were trying to do is assert both both consubstantiality, both that they are one essence, and personal distinction, both unity and trinity. Um, now, in doing this, they actually employed terms that had been used by both the modalists and the Arians um, to try to, because trying to quantify all this, they had to be very careful, so they're trying to do the best they can. The um, modalists had actually employed the term homoousios before, and, you know, there was, that was fine, because um, their problem wasn't the unity of essence, it was denying the trinity of persons. Um, so, on the side of the divine unity, um, the modalists were orthodox. Their problem was they denied the, tri the triunity. Um, and so, um, both Athanasius, who was an, or a Trinitarian, and Sibelius were fine with, with uh, that. Now, um, so they adopted this term homoousios, 
that he's of the same substance with the Father. Um, now, there were people there <coughs> who said the Father and the Son, it was Hamoi Usias. What's the difference between Hama Usias and Hamoi Usias in spelling? I. I. One little letter I. This means of like essence. Okay? So rather than the same essence, identical essence, the Father and the Son were said to be of like essence by some people. Um, these people were called semi Arians. The leader of them was Eusebius of Alexander, yeah. of Caesarea, rather. Eusebius actually wrote this, go uh, okay, ahead, read this. It's ecclesiastical history. So, it's not that bad. It's worth reading. But, um, anyway. They didn't want to say that the Father and the Son were of the same essence because they thought that, that would lead to modalism. Um, some of these people actually were just trying to not be modalists and were actually fine, but some of them actually wanted to subordinate the Son to the Father and say that he was like the Father and he wasn't actually true God in the same sense that the Father was. And that's why they were called seminarians. Um, so, the, um, you know, you could say, for example, that there's a certain sense in which the human soul is like God because we're in the image of God, but um, you certainly could say that we're of one substance with, with God. So the homoousiosis is weak. Um, and so there was nothing in the term that would um, require the Son is truly God. And so they employed, <coughs> they employed the term homoousios because they needed to use a term that the Arians couldn't torture or twist into something that they could actually uh, agree with. Because if you were talking to an Arian, and you ask the Arian, is Jesus God? You would say, yes, Jesus is God. If you ask them, is Jesus the Son of God? Well, yes, yes, he's the Son of God. And so, um, because they think that Jesus is a God, so they would say he's God because they think he's a God. He's a, a sort of semi-divine being. And so the Arians were very subtle and they could agree with you on all these different things. So they had to use this term because if they didn't use it, they needed to use something that the Arians really couldn't twist around to mean what they meant. And false teachers like to do that. They, they oftentimes will take truths and twist them around. Just like they might say, some of you say, well, is the Bible inspired? Yes. And he means that it's, it makes him feel good, not that it's actually God's very words. In the same way, the Arians could agree that Jesus was God, by which they meant that he was a divine being. So, um, so that, that's why they use the term homoousios, because it was very difficult. You couldn't really twist that into anything, um, um, anything false anything Aryan. So, um, so um, like in the creed it says that Jesus is God from God. The Aryans could agree with that in the sense that he was a God. True God from true God, they could even kind of do something with that. They could say, well, he was truly a divine being. But they really couldn't agree with the homoousios, that he's one in essence with the Father. They couldn't twist that. So that was kind of the key term in the creed. Um, so that was why they actually put that in. Now, um, some people, um, the Hamoousios people at the Council of Nicaea, the Hamoi people, they were afraid that, that what was being taught now was modalism. They thought, well, this is bad. The modalists, the civilians, they've taken over here. And so they were kind of scared of this term, Hamoousios. <coughs> um, but, um, so anyway, so but most of them ended up um, signing it, signing on. Anyway, <clears throat> now also the creed says that the son is um, begotten, not created, and so here they wanted to be careful to define um, when they say the son was begotten. They wanted to make it clear they were not saying that he was a created being, that he was created of nothing. What they were saying is that he was eternally of the Father's substance. 
And so that's, um, that was an important um, thing that they were saying, sitting there. So when they said, when, when in the Nicene Doctrine of the Trinity, when they were saying the Son is begotten of the Father, they're saying, not saying this is a sort of symbolic term for him being created, but that he really does participate in the nature of the Father. Um, he partakes of the divine essence by um, generation. So he is, um, the person of the Son has the divine essence from the person of the Father um, by eternal generation. <coughs> so um, there's unity of essence and generation of the person. When they said that he's the Son is eternally um, of the Father, they meant that he's of the essence of the Father, which he said already, um, and that um, it's, it's a necessary act. So it's not that the Father decided one day, okay, I'm going to create a Son. This is something inherent in God's being, that the Son is eternally of the Father. He's eternally begotten of the Father. So he's of the very being of the Father. So this is a, a perpetual characteristic within the divine essence. So it's not something that just begin in time. And so the fa terms father and son are correlate. Um, the term father has no meaning except with reference to the term son, nor does son except with reference to the term father. Um, so it's not the father is this pre-existent God who then decided to create a son, rather um, they are necessarily connected. Um, when they said the Son is true God of true God, what they were trying to exclude is the idea that the Father is the God and the Son is a God. So they're trying to exclude that by saying he is true God of true God. So he is the God just like the Father is the God. That's what they are trying to um, affirm in their statement. You said there's unity of essence and generational... Generation of person. Oh, generation. So the person of the Son is generated. The essence of the Son is not generated. They, what, what is generated in the Son is not mm -hmm. essence of person. And so um, that's what they were defending. And so the Son has the one eternal essence of the deity from the Father. Um, he possesses it by um, generation, and the, and the Spirit possesses it by procession. That's the way that they have it. So, um, and as, again, this generation is necessary. It's inherent in the divine, the character of God. I don't know if these work now. Is inherent within the very character of God, so it's necessary, not optional. The Arians said that it was optional. The Father decided to create the Son at some point in time, while the Trinitarians said this is necessary. The Father would not be Father without a Son, and the Son would not be Son without the Father. Um, sort of like um, you wouldn't say that God is good or God is just, or God is merciful by a decision of his will. It's necessary to his being, to be good and just, and all those things. In the same way, um, it's necessary to the very nature of God um, that <coughs> he is Father and Son and Spirit. Now, they went that far, but they wouldn't they didn't claim to perfectly define all that is involved in generation because they said, well, we can't fully plumb the depths of it. Um, so most of the explanations, um, most of the time what they say is, is this is, you know, this is not what we mean by this. Um, but, for example, one a patristic guy said, how the Father begat the Son, we profess not to tell, only we insist upon it not being in this manner or that. So, um, but a few things that were positively affirmed, they said that the um, term son denotes the deity of the second person. So he's not just 
by adoption Son of God, but he is by nature Son of God. He's eternally, really, naturally Son. Um, just like the Father is truly Father that, um, by nature, and that denotes his nature of the deity, so does the Son. Um, for example, and, and we're going to get into scripture for all this, of course, but like Hebrews 1 8 says, Under the Son he saith, Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. So there, as Son, Jesus is called God. So, he is by nature Son, um, by nature God. Um, and I think we said this already, <coughs> but the way that Sonship and uh, Spirit being Spirit, these are all the ways that the Father, Son, and Spirit participate in the undivided essence. So, they possess the divine nature as Father and as Son and Spirit. Um, so, um, Scripture employs the word son sometimes of like um, adopt, like an adopted son, as we mentioned, son of son by nature, or saying son by nature. And I think we're gonna. That's, I think it's pretty clear on that. Um, sometimes uh, an, an analogy that was used was like the sun and its rays. Um, the sun and its brightness are both light, uh, something like that. And of course, there's limits to that analogy. Um, so no one can, um, so just like the father could not be a father before he had a son of his very substance, so the paternity and sonship are inherent in um, God. Now, they also said that it was not the essence of the deity um, that was generated, but the uh, um, person. So, it's the Son doesn't have, the divine essence is not generated or proceeding, but the divine persons are generated and proceeding. So it uh, pertains to the persons, not the essence to be generated. Um, what the identifying particularity, what makes the Son Son is that he's begotten, and what makes the Spirit Spirit is that he proceeds, and the Father is neither begotten nor proceeding. Uh, but begets and, and sends forth the Spirit. And so um, these terms don't uh, imply a subordination in terms of the essence of the Godhead. Um, they describe the way that the persons um, possess um, their nature. So um, they're not, um, there's a relation of order. The Father is the first person, the Son is the second, and the, the Spirit is the third. Um, but there's not a subordination of essence. There's nothing in the term Father or Son that implies a difference of um, essence. And so that's um, important there. Do you have any questions about what they were trying to argue for in um, the uh, their definitions here of um, of the Trinity and the Nicene uh, Nicene Creed. I'm gonna have to meditate upon that for a while. But how long did they actually meet for? If it was rolled three times. Um, I'm not sure exactly how long they met for. Um, I'm not sure how long they're meeting for. That's, that's a good question. <coughs> they did argue. They did debate over all these different things. It's not but, just something to get together on a Saturday or whip it. <laughs> no, no, they didn't just get together with that. They had they got all these guys together. I mean, also, you also you took a while to travel too. So these guys yeah. got together, and yeah, because you had you had the Hamo Usias party. Um, the people defending the one essence. You had people who thought it would be better to say Hamoi Usias, and then you had the Arians um, who were there. Um, and so you had these three groups of people kind of arguing with each other um, to try to pound out. And they had, you had people who had not thought about it to this kind of depth and were trying to figure out, you know, they were 
Uh, remember we said the doctrine of the Trinity developed in the context of worship. Say so people were worshiping the Father, worshiping the Son, worshiping the Spirit, but they hadn't, maybe they weren't quite as like theologically minded as if they were saying, well, what is the right? What, well, how can we be careful to avoid you know, errors here, avoid the Sabellian error, avoid the Arian error? How can we define this carefully? So you had, yeah, so no, they were trying to think this through um, at the council, um, for sure. And you had some people who didn't, didn't really care, who just wanted to, thought this was, you know, just, we'll just tolerate whatever. So you